Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist. Today I'm going to talk about gauge symmetries. Why bother to do that? Well, this is one of these deep things that shows up in quantum field theory. And you need to be in graduate school, of course, to understand this issue, uh, how it applies to Lagrangians. And one of the yet another amazing thing that's happened to me was that I found out that my effort to unify gravity with the standard model ended up with this really, really deep uh, idea. I, it feels kind of like, you know, I, f I found another five carat diamond and it's like, oh, that's nice. I haven't <laughs> seen a five carat diamond like this before. I mean, what I mean specifically is that you study this gauge symmetry stuff uh, at the level of the Lagrangian and then you use a Lagrangian through the Euler-Lagrange equations to get to the field equations. And those field equations are then gauge dependent. And if you're really skilled at these types of arts, then for a particular type of problem, you can choose a gauge that makes solving the problem at hand much easier. That's not a skill I actually possess. I just know that there are people with such skills. But the stunning thing about when I put gravity and the standard model together at a rank one kind of field level is that the field equations, those are also invariant under a gauge transformation. And I've like never heard of that before. <laughs> so it feels like this, like, wow, that's really kind of surprising. So what I'm going to do in this talk, is actually, is go through a question I got about that claim. So let me give you the backstory here. I've been going around the country, maybe once or twice a year, uh, to talk about my work. And it's always at a meeting where I'm not invited. <laughs> they, 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 they say, if you wish to talk on whatever, as long as it's about physics, uh, you can go ahead and do that. And I've been doing that. And people don't get back to me. <laughs> it's just the nature of the game. I'm off in left field, and who wants to deal with a guy off in left field? That's fine. I can deal with that. So I went to the 13th Eastern Gravity Meeting and actually did have wonderful conversations with one fellow there <laughs> because I use hyper-complex numbers and he happened to be into hyper-complex numbers. So, you know, we, we, we really uh, had a good time talking to each other. Uh, I wore around this t-shirt, which uh, I claim anyway is the... Uh, unified field theory we uh, physicists have been searching for for <laughs> quite some time uh, but nobody else like came up to me and asked about it like what you know where can I buy that no that that, that just didn't happen so I had this one super great interaction with one person and then I flew home <laughs> and then like two or three weeks later this graduate student who was there you know, wrote me and said, wow, that was kind of interesting. Would you like to come to our university and just, you know, talk about it? So it was like, wow, this is the first time somebody said I should go there and chat about my stuff. And he wrote back and said, uh, hold on a second. Uh, this is an official, okay? It's just me and my friend. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk for a little while, we'll go eat for a little while, you know, that sort of thing. So I said, okay, I understand, not official, you know, that's cool. It's a little over an hour drive away, and I went down there, showed up at around 11, and we started chatting, and then came lunchtime, chatted over lunch, came back. I talked for six solid nerdly hours. <laughs> And I want to make it clear, I didn't repeat myself, okay? So that was really 
a fun experience for me. They claim, and I, I'm going to believe them, that, that they found it very informative uh, from their perspective. And what happened at one point was I made this claim about uh, gauge transformations, and they said, uh, excuse me, um, why is that so? And I wasn't able to back it up. So I'm just going to kind of detail that issue and then finally uh, my detailed response to that question that they raised that I couldn't answer uh, at the time. So we have to start again with what is a Lagrangian? And as I explain it, it's every sort of interaction that can happen inside of uh, per unit volume. And what you do with such a thing is you integrate that over all of space and time. Which means that what you get out of it is uh, energy times time. The reason that's of interest is because what you then do is try and find a variation of that Lagrangian such that it actually doesn't change your integral. The reason you, that's interesting is you now have a symmetry of your Lagrangian and where you have a symmetry of your Lagrangian, you actually have a conserved quantity. So this is the super deep way to understand things like conservation of energy, conservation of linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum, conservation of electric charge. Really, they're all coming from the same kind of Lagrangian symmetry kind of understanding. So there's a type of symmetry that's called gauge symmetry. And if you have particles traveling at the speed of light, they need to have this sort of gauge symmetry. And so Maxwell's equations, for example, they have gauge symmetry. But, and, and then what you do with your Lagrangian, that it has this gauge symmetry, is you apply Euler-Lagrange and you get the, um, the field equations. Now those field equations, you can actually, you do have this choice about picking a gauge, and that gauge can make the equations look really, really simple. In the case of the Maxwell equations, you get this 4D wave equation, which is just this um, de Lambertian operator, uh, second time derivative, uh, minus, uh, what is that, the Laplacian acting on um, a four potential just equals the current. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's pretty simple. All right. And my proposal for how gravity should work is awfully darn similar to that. In other words, I have a Lagrangian, I generate my field equations, and I have a gauge choice, and if I choose exactly the same gauge, the gauge is called the Lorentz gauge, then I end up with equations that are darn similar, they actually only differ in one sign. It's uh, now the second time derivative, uh, derivative plus del squared uh, acting on a four potential equals, oh, actually equals rho. That's right, I forget the, uh, the, the, the four vector part, I mean the three vector part actually has got a uh, an odd little uh, sign change in there. So it's not the same operator working uh, throughout um, for the field equations. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that's, that's what we expect. We, I expect it, I should say, is that you, know, you have this gauge choice and particularly using the Lorentz gauge, you should end up with an expression that's relatively simple. But then, on the back of this shirt, I've got my, uh, my Lagrangian for what I think is going to be the unification of gravity and uh, electromagnetism, the weak force and the strong force. And when you go and you then generate the field equations on the front, those equations don't care at all about what the gauge choice is. In other words, the field equations not only the Lagrangian, but the field equations themselves are invariant under Lorentz gauge. Uh, sorry, under, under any choice of gauge. So, so if you choose the Lorentz gauge, it doesn't change them. 
you choose the Coulomb gauge, the static gauge, doesn't change them at all. And the question that was asked was, why? <laughs> that's, that's a fair question. So I didn't know. And I went back and I looked at it and now I know. See, what happens is you look at the Lagrangian, okay? And this gauge symmetry involves things like d phi dt, dAx dx, dAy dy, daz dz. And when you look through the Lagrangian, they aren't there. <laughs> That's why it's independent of the choice of gauge, because those are the players in this type of gauge symmetry, and if they're not there, then you're free to choose what you want to, okay? But then what you do is you apply Euler-Lagrange to the expression. And I know this Lagrangian looks scary, okay, because it's got more partial differential equations than you've probably ever written, uh, but it breaks down into two t classes. There are the pure terms, or I should really call them squared terms, and there are mixed terms. Now, the squared terms, like uh, d phi dx squared, is really only going to involve phi and dx's, okay? It's never going to get into the kind of uh, space where it needs to in, or in order to involve gauge. So, so those things never, the terms that show up from them, the square terms, never are involved in this choice of gauge uh, issue. Now, if you look at the mixed terms, you'll see something like a d phi dx and a dax dt. And you go, oh, if, if I could switch things around. Well, what happens when you apply Euler-Lagrange is that you'll get the d phi dx, oh, you'll get the second derivative of d phi dx dt. And since you can mix around those partial derivatives, you can see that then, then, then there's a d phi uh, dt. And a similar way with the d a x dt, you put that through Euler-Lagrange and you're going to get a second derivative of d a x dt dx. And so you say, oh, that's going to be the one that is going to be sensitive to your choice of gauge. So this is the Maxwell uh, Lagrangian. The one for my own proposal for gravity looks just the same, except the mixed terms uh, flip signs. So it too will depend on the choice of gauge. But what happens for my unification proposal is those uh, mixed terms get wiped out. And all I have left are the pure terms, the terms that never cared about gauge in the first place. So the resulting field equations are going to be invariant under a gauge choice because it's only the squared terms, only these pure guys, and they're never there's never going to be a handle in there for uh, kind of a, a mixed derivative that, that connects to uh, gauge choices. So that was my answer uh, to their very valid question. Thank you very much. All the girls in the classroom think he's hot. He shows up wearing the sandals with the white socks. He hears him giggling while he's got his back to the class. He thinks he's got an eraser mark on his ass. Girls from the hall show up to hear him talk Even though most of the time he's covered in chalk Math prop rock star Math prop rock star Oh yeah Math prop rock star He was young, he never thought that he would be a math prop rock star